The ankle joint, as it's known, actually consists of three parts. Talocrural joint, the distal tibiofibular joint, and the subtalar joint. Talo is short for talus. Cruel refers to the lower leg, which in this case consists of the tibia and fibula interconnected shank that articulates with the talus bone, and that is the distal tibiofibular joint. The subtalar joint is the interconnection of the talus bone of the foot to the navicular anteriorly and the calcaneus posteriorly. The posterior part's mobility is the one that's tested in this common physical therapy position. And the anterior portion's articulation doesn't really truly occur until the foot hits the ground. Once on the ground, the ankle has two motions. Supination, which begins at the tibia, where the outside of the heel bone inverts towards the ground, which gives space for the talus to elevate and rotate on top of that space that the heel bone just vacated, which relatively occurs when the knee is in more extension. For pronation, the opposite occurs. The heel will then dip to the outside, dropping the talus down, being initiated from the tibia, occurring relatively in more knee flexion. So you end up getting this spiral rotary motion, and you can imagine that any restriction along this kinematic chain can cause an inability to efficiently produce this rotary motion. True, the body itself has continuous fascial connections throughout the body. Now these can get quite complex, but one such example found that stretching the posterior chain on one side caused an opening of the hip to another side, which caused openings in ankle dorsiflexion to that side. So how does opening up access into the hip joint open up the ankle? You have to consider common restrictions of joints as a result of modern lifestyle. So there's the upper crossed syndrome, but there's also the lower crossed syndrome. Here, we find that the glutes can become weak as a result of the position that it's forced into, and that would be being locked short. Yes, stretching is one way to open the hip up, but we have to consider what's happening with the hip joint itself to alleviate long-term restriction. With this lower crossed syndrome, the resting position of the glutes becomes extension at the head of the hip. When you extend the hips, you posteriorly roll and anteriorly glide the head of the hip in its socket. This shoots the hip forward and the femur backwards in this extension moment. The body, however, is very efficient. If there's no stimulus present to perform that other movement, which is an anterior roll and a posterior glide, the body will lock not only the glutes short, but the hip joint itself forward. So what does that have to do with the ankles? I just explained how the heel bone, the talus, and the tibia and knee all need to act in unison in order to create supination and pronation, and that any restriction along the way will lead to kinematic insufficiency in these motions because of being locked in a certain motion at rest. So the entire limb needs to be considered, including the hip, because the muscles that actually control this tibial motion actually begins at the hip. The bicep femoris on the lateral hip controls external rotation of that tibia, while the semimembranosus, tendinosus, and sartorius and gracilis muscles, which collectively form this duck foot looking insertion site on the medial side, create tibial internal rotation. So what does this have to do with the hips being thrusted forward? If the hip joint is stuck in relative extension, that means the muscles too will be stuck. These muscles extend the hip, flex the knee, and internally rotate the tibia. But if the muscles are stuck in extension, they become locked short in their hip location even at rest. Thus, their ability to flex the knee and internally rotate then becomes very inefficient to perform. When in doubt, the body will move towards efficiency whenever possible, which looks like if locked short at the hips, instead of internal rotation of the tibia to get pronation, the body will instead keep that external rotation and just dump all the forces to the inside. This is where you get that duck-footed posture that most people have with externally rotated hips and feet pointed at 45 degree angles. This is an aside, but for this reason, I don't really think there's one way to tell people to move because in the perfect world, there is a perfect posture, no restrictions, no imbalances, perfect strength and perfect range, but you will never get there. You can't because we live in an imperfect world. So don't fear about moving the best way, but based on the access you currently have, there is a more efficient way for you. But if someone has stuck hips, there's no reason to force them to cue them to move in a certain way in relation to their tibia, they don't have the motion, they can't perform it. So the issue is access. Get the specific limitation that you have opened and strong, and you're likely to improve in these rotary arthro 
kinematics. Now, depending on one's history, these restrictions can be anywhere else along that chain. Hip, knee, tibia, ankle, talus, calcaneus, and any of the structures that intertwine along all of these areas, it all needs to be taken into account. So that can get quite complex if you're a perfectionist, but like I said, we live in an imperfect world. I and every single person in the world have some sort of imperfection in our kinematic chain. It's inevitable. You can't prevent it, but movement is medicine and you can improve it more and more day by day. As a future clinician, I want my clients to focus on opportunity rather than fear. For example, one of my followers shared with me an interesting study regarding foot posture in relation to injury risk. The study was a case control of 600 runners comparing pronation, neutral, and supination with injury risk. They found that supination to high supination postures, they increase injury risk to two to 582 times compared to neutral and pronation being three to 43 times of an injury risk for runners running 2.5 miles a day. So let's flip the wording there to opportunity. The closer we get to regaining access in the joints responsible for creating pronation and supination. Because remember, pronation and supination is not solely a foot motion. It starts at the tibia and it can be affected from the hip. We can get, depending on our starting point, anywhere from two to 582 times of a decrease in injury risk if we are these runners. And that's an astronomical decrease. Okay, so we discussed how the ankle functions and why we want access and strength. So now I'm going to explain what movements I would include for a comprehensive ankle science protocol. So to maximize your ankle ability with science from rehab to resilience, first, we need to free our joints. We can begin at the hip with a posterior hip capsule mobilization. You'll start in a prone position. You'll spin the working leg out to the side, keeping the off leg straight and sink down and back into that hip until you feel a pull in the outside in the back of the hip. And all you're gonna do is pulse in and out of that, opening up the restrictions in that capsule. And again, this is going to allow for a more free flowing movement for true hip flexion, which is important to access. Again, if we're going to be able to create that knee flexion, which is important if we're going to be able to create that tibial rotation and ankle dorsiflexion. This is important for actually having volitional access to supination and pronation. And as described before, that decreases your injury risk with athletic movements. We can then progress this movement of the posterior hip capsule mobilization to a reverse hip thrust, making sure to progress from flat ground to elevated and then loaded as you can tolerate. And for hips behind heels, slight knee bend, kiss the ground with the off leg and press up with the strong leg. This again is going to help mobilize that posterior hip capsule and allow for more rotation above, which allows for more rotation below. It allows for more volitional control of supination and pronation instead of being locked in one direction. So then we want to get that foot and ankle articulation and make sure that there's motion in that joint. I'm gonna play some videos from when I was at the gym. Um, when I tried to film it last time at the gym, my microphone died, so I couldn't film it there. Now it's kind of cold outside, so I'm in a hoodie. But if you look at these videos, if we can't get these motions, the motion at the heel, the motion at the midfoot, and the motion with the ankle and the talus, then supination and pronation will be ineffective for every single step and every single land that we take. And then the natural progression from this point is making sure that we can load these positions so we can maximize the benefits to functional activity. Okay, so after freeing the joints, we want to make sure that we can now clear the neural tension. So at the ankle, it's as simple as getting load with the straight leg and moving the ankle, and then pulling out any restrictions along that neural path, adding more and more tension and more and more loading. This is important because when neural tension is present, there's less effective nerve conduction velocity. What does that mean? This means that the ability to get the command from the brain to the muscle is slower because there's roadblocks along that neural path. More free flowing movement means greater possibility for volitional control. And as you can see in this clip, you can do the same thing for the nerves that go alongside the front of the thigh with a couch stretch because this biases the femoral nerve. And finally, and very simply, we're just gonna stretch and strengthen all around. Once those joint and neural restrictions are lessened, we can now put the body in a great position to maximize glute, hamstring, hip flexor, calf, and tibialis development, leading to comprehensive attainment of supination and pronation from the ankle, knee, and hip, which decreases injury risk and increases athletic potential.